Today we're taking a look at Revolution Road from Compass Games, and this is actually two games in one box. It is uh, from Boston to Concord. This is the game we're going to be looking at in detail in the video, and also Bunker Hill. And looking here at the back of the box, just a bit, we can see what this game, these games are about. In April and June of 1775, two events occurred that marked the point of no return between Britain and her New England colonies. On April 19th of that year, a running battle took place along the road between Boston and Concord involving British soldiers and colonial revolutionaries. In the days following, the British force in Boston found itself under siege by thousands of newly formed revolutionary militia. And then on June 17th, the British and revolutionaries clashed again in the epic pitched battle of Bunker Hill just across the Charles River from Boston. So here we're looking on the back of the box at the two maps that come in this box. This is from Boston to Concord. That's the game we're going to be treating in the video. And this is the other game uh, entitled Bunker Hill that we're not going to have time to take a look at. Just a quick glance here. First of all, here are the uh, design development and graphic design credits in the game. And Compass Games assigns this a playing time of two to three hours. Um, I think once you know the rules, it would be shorter than that, particularly if you're playing solo, which is what I'm going to demonstrate here. Complexity, four out of ten. I don't know what scale they're using, so it's hard to assess this number. I would call this a... Um, <sighs> A light, a very a light medium game. Uh, if if you consider it medium, it's on the light side of medium or on the heavy side of light, if that makes sense. I think it's suitable for um, probably suitable as an introductory game. Uh, it would be complex for a non war gamer, but for somebody who is a war gamer, I think you'd find this, um, you know, not complex, but with a lot of decision making and enjoyment, nonetheless. Solitaire ranking is high, and indeed it comes with some solitaire system and a sort of basic solitaire bot. I will discuss this in the video. I don't actually use that myself. Um, and uh, they say the components, full color rules, um, and playing pieces for both games. There's a lot of player aids in the game. And they're great, um, very useful. Here is the Boston to Concord action summary. And um, there are many actions that you can take in the game, and they're all pretty well illustrated on this card with the relevant rules portions, which makes it nice. You don't have to go back so much to refer to the details of the rules. I mentioned there are um, solitaire bots. So, for example, um, you get cards with the solitaire bot rules for you could play either against either side and I'll talk about that later in the video there um, is an extended example of combat on a card as well as the list of it's a victory point based game and there's a lot of a lot of detail in how you assign victory points so that comes on a separate card too and um, you get all this for both games. So here's this for Bunker Hill as well. And um, this is an example of a player aid card from Bunker Hill. And coming back again, you've got the Patriot bot here. So there's a, there's a, a ton of player aids. They're very well done. And um, also get the victory conditions for the other game. So you're getting a lot here in the box right off the bat. And you're getting the rule book itself is four color um, printed on a matte uh, paper, very clear printing, some historical illustrations. Um, and overall, I think very clear. There's a couple of points of ambiguity that I needed to double check. A um, little bit of uh, some minor discrepancies in some of the rules, but basically I found this to be quite clearly laid out and um, again, perhaps somewhat intimidating for a total non-war gamer, but for anyone with war game experience, this is going to be um, not terribly complicated to follow. Sequence of play is very uh, simple. You obtain the action points for the game, and that's done by a card draw that will show. And then you perform your actions. There are many actions available during the game. This is the heart of the game, and we will go over most of them in the video. And then there's some very basic end turn maintenance that you need to do in terms of removing markers. So very, very simple and straightforward. 
This is the map set up for the two-player scenario and briefly want to point out some of what's going on here. The regions are denoted by these blue lines and they represent roughly four miles across. You are having Boston over here and if you know Massachusetts at all, you will know that right here is Lexington and here is Concord. And these are the central movement points in the game. One of the victory conditions, or one of the victory points, I should say, this is a victory point based game, is involving movement um, into Concord and Lexington and um, occupation of Concord by the British at the end of the game. The lack of that is an automatic victory for the Patriots. So that is something to be considered. There also ends up being movement back toward Boston with some captured uh, Patriots that we'll talk about later on. So it's area uh, control, but also area movement around. The other thing of significance to note here that at the beginning of the game there are these hidden arms markers and the British are attempting to uncover them and search them successfully and they will lose victory points for any unsearched areas at the end of the game and gain victory points for what they can do. The other aspect of the game on the Patriot side are the three Knight Riders that you have. Paul Revere here in Charleston. We have Dawes in Boston and inactive at the beginning of the game, but under this marker here is Prescott in Lexington. These Knight Riders are going to be moving out west and around the state to uh, alert militia and Minutemen who are represented under these gathering icons scattered around the state. So at the very beginning of the game, as we'll see when we get into more detail, there is um, a lot of movement around on the Patriot side to try to notify the Minutemen and the militia that are in the state. Bottom of the map, there is a listing of player actions, and the flags next to the action represent which side can take that action. In most cases, both sides can do it, but in some cases, no. And it's pretty helpful to reference the rules where you can look this up. Unfortunately, um, so much space was taken up with these very big um, this big font that they don't uh, have any like one sentence reminder of what it is, which I think could have been even more useful. But it is nice to have that there. Uh, there's some cards here, which will explain how those work. You have your action track and there's reserve action track too. This uh, over here at the left is going to explain to you during setup what to place under these gather and alert markers. So you know if you see this icon, it means to place militia, militia and a leader, etc. And uh, you can just see here under this alert marker, we have unknown militia. So this told us to place a militia and this means an unknown value at the beginning. You will be pulling from a draw cup when you reveal, say, uh, this alert icon, you'll be pulling from a draw cup to see what you get. And here's an example um, in Concord of the gather marker where we were told ultimately there's going to be a leader, a Minuteman, and an unknown militia. So we represent that with here's the Minuteman and the unknown militia and a random leader. At the top of the map, we have a uh, victory point track. Now, this is not going to be sufficient to tally all the victory points in the game. I've used it to tally certain victory points that come from map activity as opposed to from the capture of units, etc. And later on in the video, I'll talk about the various ways to obtain victory points. But um, for example, something that gets pulled off the map, this hidden arms marker is going to award three Three, at least three victory points if it is successfully searched, or I should say potentially three victory points if it's successfully searched. And um, I've been using it to sort of keep track here, but this is not as useful as it seems because it just doesn't, um, it doesn't go high enough and there's only one track on it. And um, I didn't find it that useful actually. Turn track here, and um, again, once again, showing you the design credits here up at the right. Before the game even begins, or I should say the beginning of the game, is 
recognizable to people who know this period of American history because what happens is the game starts, the game opens with the call to arms for the Patriot player which will activate your Knight Riders as long as they haven't moved yet and of course they haven't moved because the game is just starting and each activated Knight Rider gets four activity points. The concept of activity points is only used in connection with the Knight Riders. Each region that they move into and the regions again are denoted by by these blue lines cost one activity point and what they're doing is they're traveling around and they are attempting to go to the gathering places and the gathering places are denoted by these um, sort of tavern signs these um, well, a tavern sign with men gathering there, and they can um, alert the people to the town by flipping these over to the muster side, and that costs an activity point. So they can basically travel and alert prior to the start of the game, and we're going to have uh, Paul Revere do this. Now you can see in Charleston they are already they have already been alerted um, here, but he's going to move out and he's going to move one to into Cambridge and then he will um, flip this over for his third activity point and um, he doesn't have to use all four. Every time a Knight Rider moves you have to do a capture check and to see if they've been captured and the way you do a capture check is really simple. You roll a 1d6 and on a 6 he is captured and rolled to his captured side. He was not captured and I'll just show you the captured side here. Uh, later in the video there's a, someone captured and um, I talk about how they can possibly be freed. We also have here uh, William Dawes in Boston right here. He's going to move down into Roxbury and um, he's going to um, call, uh, alert the men there. And so again, we just simply flip this over and we will do another capture check on him, rolling this d6. And we got a five, so he's all right. Now, we have these. Um, um, men now who are sort of getting ready for uh, the battle and they have to muster themselves to do this. The um, end of the turn here for the call to arms or the end of this portion of the game and it happens within the game too is you would take this um, muster counter or chit away revealing underneath we have here a leader and we have an unknown militia and this is denoted by the map itself will tell you what you should be placing there the leader sign and the militia sign and then we will determine the strength of the militia with from pulling randomly from our draw cup to get um, a counter that we place there on its active side and we get somebody with a strength of one. So this, and then we remove um, this marker and we also remove uh, the uh, muster and gathering counter. And then we go back here to uh, Cambridge and we do the same thing. Now here in Cambridge is slightly different. The green, um, circle here. This is a Minuteman, and we'll talk about him in a second, but let's do this first. So we're going to pull out a random militia to see what strength we get here, and we get a zero strength. We'll talk about that too, and then we remove these two. So the Minutemen. When the Minutemen are alerted to represent the fact that they had a lot of speed and more training than the average militia, they are then allowed to move immediately up to two regions away. So uh, what we can do then here is we can move our Minuteman here um, up to two regions away to begin to, you know, spread out across the area. So what does it mean to have a militia of strength of zero? Well, what this means is that he must be with a leader to have any strength at all. And right now he isn't. So when he's paired with a leader, he can have a one strength, but right now he's got nothing. And um, this all, again, has happened prior to turn one. And then when we start in on turn one, we move down to the card draw to see what our actions are and we see here that both sides have three actions potentially available to them so we'll set that up here the way I play um, is you know obvious just roll to d6s and whoever gets the higher roll is going to go first so in this case the British will go first and um, we will follow and we'll each take our three actions to open up the game 
turn one has ended and I want to just show you what happened because it's indicative of at least the early portion of this game. The British have moved across and therefore they have their moved counters on them. You can only move a stack or units once per turn. And additionally, at a certain point, they, when Paul Revere had moved out west, when his capture check was done, he actually had been flipped over to the capture side. Luckily for the Patriots, they still had some actions left. And what they did was they moved these militia and Minutemen into the region with Paul Revere so that they could attempt to to um, have him escape, and what the uh, and this is where th one of the benefits of these zero um, uh, force militia come in because to do an escape attempt, you are rolling a d6. You need to get a six, and you can add one um, for the presence of any unit there. So indeed, we actually on our last action of the turn we rolled a three, thus getting us to a six with these guys. So Paul Revere became uh, he escaped which was lucky because per the rules at the end of this turn he could have been moved up to two regions into Boston and once he's in Boston he gets moved off the map you lose him for the rest of the game and the uh, British would be awarded some victory points for that that's obviously pretty ahistorical because he got captured so soon but that could have happened it didn't because um, of the fact that we still had some actions left to move additionally the um, the British took advantage of this um, hinder muster marker option that they have. They, uh, it's called the hinder action, and what they can do is they can place for an action in their turn, they can place this marker over the gathering place, therefore making it impossible for the Patriots for up to two turns. You see the number two here. This will get flipped over to its one side in the next turn and then removed that this will prohibit the Patriots from conducting any call to arms in this area and next turn they would have definitely um, gotten ready to do that because under this moved counter is William Dawes and he would have continued along to try to do that. The other thing that the British are trying to do is to uncover these hidden arms and they were successful in doing that here in this area and I get into this a little more detail so I won't go into the rules of how this happens later in the video it, I show you how it happens but um, suffice it to say they did discover some hidden arms that ultimately were worth two victory points for them so right here at the end of this turn already I've got them marked with two victory points. So that's what happened at um, in the first turn there was no combat um, there was no opportunity fire which is to say that nobody moved through a region containing another piece another side if that had happened and a die check was rolled for opportunity fire that would count as the shot heard around the world and um, if the Patriots had done that, initiated that, they would immediately give five victory points to the British. So there's a little bit of trying to avoid being, at least on the Patriot side of things, being the first one to initiate any type of combative action because you're giving away five victory points if you do that. And that is the opening of the game. It is as I said before, it is thematic, it's cinematic, the game rules are a little different um, early on by that call to arms, that free action for call to arms, and it opens up the game very nicely in terms of giving you a flow and a sense of activity and narrative building. I can give a little bit of sense of what this game plays like by looking at this beginning of turn seven, so really mid-game for one of the games that I've been playing and show you a little bit about what's going on. I've got my Paul Revere has already exited the map and as such is represented here. What he can do, and he's done this once already, is to call in some of the reserves that uh, there's another reserve here by these alert markers that are having more reinforcements coming in off the map. Now, we can see here this big stack of uh, British is coming in on turn 9, so we're at the beginning of turn 7, so we're going to be getting a huge landing party in Boston, which is right over here, with one of the cannons that I know will be coming in. So one of the goals of the Patriots at this point is to continue to get in as many reinforcements as they possibly can. Now, how can you do this? Well, we can do this with 
one of our three Knight Riders. So we've got Paul Revere here. We've got another Knight Rider, Dawes, up here. The problem is that he's got to make his way all the way down to the bottom of the map here to exit and therefore be eligible to bring in the uh, or to activate these alert markers down here. Now my understanding or what makes sense to me is that they can only do this once per turn although I think the rules are a little bit unclear on that but that is that is what I'm how I'm playing. So it's going to take a while for him to move all the way down there to get to a position of being able to alert. And then my final um, Knight Rider here, Prescott, he was captured. So he was captured pretty early on in Concord and is being moved now slowly across the map toward Boston where he will exit and therefore give victory points to the British if I can't stop it. One of the ways to stop it is to conduct an escaped capture action and what you need to do for that, I wasted a couple of actions last turn trying to get to the same uh, region as the captured Knight Rider and then with your eligible units you get a plus one die modifier for everybody who's eligible here. So in this case I had one, two, three, four. I just needed to roll a six or better with a d6 and indeed I rolled a one. So that wasted a couple of actions. You know this is a this is a luck-based game in many regards and that was unfortunate. I mean I'm imagining if I can keep my militia and Minutemen together here for the next turn I'll be able to uncapture this fellow and enable him to continue to move back and try to help me with alerting some more men. So well, you might be wondering, you know, what's going to prohibit me from doing that the next turn because I basically just need to roll a 2 through 6 on a d6 to free this guy and um, bring him back to activate some more men. And this is part of what makes the game interesting because you can't get tied up too much in the minutia if you forget about the big picture. And part of the big picture here is that this is Concord. And if the um, Patriot player prevents the British player from occupying Concord at the end of the game, there's an automatic victory to the Patriots. So I can't go too far afield, and I know that at the end of every turn, the British player is going to have the option of moving my captured um, Knight Rider up to two um, regions away toward Boston, and that could potentially draw me further and further away. The other thing is, I don't know how many actions I'm going to get next turn. The way the actions work is you draw, there's a set of cards, I think there's 22 of them that play out in the two-player game, and you draw through basically one card per turn, although there is um, a there are some actions that require to draw a card to get this random hash mark. So you cycle through that a little bit more than one card a turn, potentially. But you're given your number of actions based on the card draw. And for example, if we flip back here to see the cards earlier in the game, um, you know, there was one card that only gave me three actions. And presumably there are more cards that will, that will happen to. I've had a lot of cards recently with five actions, which is the maximum. But um, if I'm only getting three actions, there's a lot of things potentially I want to do. And that might mean sacrificing this option to, you know, basically just giving up on trying to uncapture this fellow right now. And of course, again, the farther away he gets, when he escapes, if he does, he would have to make his way all the way back here to the um, map board on the west to um, get these alert markers going. Because at that point, probably, if it didn't happen right away, um, Dawes, unless he was captured, would have moved down to the south already to alert from the south. So that is just something to think about and manage. You can see here the uh, British have a couple of actions in reserve. You can reserve up to one action a turn with a maximum of two in reserve if you have run out of other things to do. So I find that this reserve thing, while it sounds great, doesn't really come into play too much um, in the end because you often do have the option of doing something. And if you have the option of doing something, you either, either must do it or use an action to pass as opposed to putting something into reserve. 
I want to spend some time talking about these hidden arms markers because this comes into play a lot early in the game and is absent in the solo version, which I'll talk about later when I talk about the solo version. But it is um, an interesting and uh, very sort of cinematic and thematic game mechanic that replicates the fact that the Patriots had hidden arms around, there are 13 places, locations, this is one that has already been searched, hidden arms around the countryside in people's houses, and the British were attempting to locate and destroy those hidden arms. On some of the markers, you'll see a number here, which represents an automatic victory point awarded if successfully searched. And in other cases, um, such as the one up here, they're just blank. You can get victory points for those, even the blank ones, if you're successful. And this is how it happens. What you do is you uh, notice that the cards here, which provide the action points, also have a random hash mark, or a circle, I should say, with hash marks in them. They could have no hash marks. They could have two. I think two is the maximum one. Oh no, I guess not. Four, one, nothing. So this is a random um, draw and you are adding the hash marks to the any number that you see here for the total of victory points you would be awarded if you get um, a successful action in the uh, search for arms. What can happen, however, is that you get negative modifiers. So for example, were the British occupied here and deciding to do a search, they would first have to dis deduct from what it, well, they wouldn't do a search. There's too many militia and Minutemen here because you must subtract um, for every militia or Minutemen in the region. You would have to subtract one. If there are militia and Minutemen in the region, no matter how many they are, you'd have to subtract two. Um, and the actual amount doesn't matter. So, but in this case, we have. Um, this green fellow is a Minuteman, this is a Militia, so we've got both, so we're already at a minus two. So immediately we are at zero because we're getting two, we're minus two, and then the question is, is it worth doing? Um, what if this card has five hash marks? Well, that would give us five victory points. What if it had none? We would just be wasting our turn. Is there a way to find out what's in this card? Well, the answer is there is a way to find out what's in that card, and that is with the gather intelligence action. What you need to do if you're going to use this action, which allows you to look at the next two cards in the stack and return them in order, is you need to expend one of your available actions in the turn to do that. And then when it comes back to you, if you like what you saw, you could then do the search um, action for your next action in the turn and get those victory points. So we know right here we're at a net zero. So the question is, it's only going to be worth it based on what's on this card or the next card. So I could expend and do my gathering intelligence, which shows me nothing here and nothing there. Put those back. That was an action. Clearly, we're not going to then try to do a search. And we also need to remember that for the next two cards, there's no benefit. So this is something to think about. It comes up a lot early in the game because early in the game, what's happening on the side of the British is that they are attempting to reveal as many of these hidden arms markers as they possibly can that are scattered around. They don't have a lot of um, British regulars initially. They're coming in from Boston and beginning basically to search the countryside here. And um, they are gaining victory points along the way for those successful searches. Of course, on the opposing side, what the Patriots are trying to do, as we've already talked about, is to activate as many militia as possible and Minutemen as possible because they know that coming in on turn nine are great reinforcements in Boston. As we look out here over the turn track and Boston is here, Charleston up there, it's a good opportunity to talk about what uh, does not happen in the game early on or what you are trying to avoid in a way, certainly if you are the Patriot player, which is engaging in any type of combat. Because if the Patriot player initiates the first 
combat of the game as an attacker, which would include any type of um, fire, and we'll go over the types that they have, you automatically give the British player five victory points. So you do want to try to avoid doing that. And what that results in initially is a little bit of a sort of cat and mouse uh, situation moving around the board, at least as I was playing it, where the Patriots are attempting to send out their Knight Riders to alert the Minutemen to move west um, and gain more militia, and the uh, British player is attempting to do these arm search that we just talked about, and in a way, everybody's trying to avoid everybody else in terms of initiating combat. Certainly, the way the rules are written, the uh, Patriots are trying to avoid losing those five victory points by conducting any type of attack or assault, and there are various ways to initiate combat, which we will get into. Um, there are some um, optional rules that I was playing with, which do include opportunity fire, meaning that if you are, in this case, what that means is if a player is moving through a region that has an unbroken enemy piece, the enemy immediately rolls one die, and um, on a roll of six, one hit is scored. In this case, for what I'm talking about here, the opportunity fire, even if it's unsuccessful, does count as the initiation of combat. So that rule makes it a little more likely that um, combat will ha can happen earlier on because people are there's a lot of activity centered around here because the um, British are coming in and moving here and as I said tending to kind of come out depending on how they leave Boston coming out and beginning to search um, around and um, you end up in a situation where opportunity fire could happen but at least initially you are spending a lot of time which I found to be very thematic and cinematic in a way, uh, moving around and with your various goals in mind, in a sense trying to do what you want to do and avoid the other person as much as possible. Here we are at the beginning of turn nine. This is when Percy's reinforcements come in and so we're going to just indicate here what's happening. We bring in the reinforcements to Boston and he's coming with a field cannon and you can also note that all of the British regulars have a uh, black dot in the upper right corner. These are the only counters that do. And the reason for this is that during the rest of the game, we're going to be keeping track of these. Um, once they enter, they have eight regulars in the field cannon. And if the Percy leader gets to Lexington with the cannon and at least four unbroken regulars with these dots on them at any time, the British player is going to receive three victory points immediately. So that's a one-time award, but um, you are going to be attempting to do that because if you don't do that, then the Patriot player is going to get five victory points at the end of the game. So one of the things that um, they're going to be attempting to do, aside from um, conducting combat and serving as the reinforcements is to make their way across the state and ultimately get to Lexington to get these benefits. The other thing that has happened since we last checked in is that our captured um, Knight Rider is still captured and really getting relatively close to Boston so we're probably going to just lose the opportunity there because we decided not to follow him and um, therefore it would just be a matter of spending an action to hope we rolled a six to free him and I'm not the actions at this point are too dear in order to do that. We uh, on the British side of things an attempt was made to capture John Hancock and this is also a very luck based situation indeed the British failed to do that and they elected as per the rules to spend some victory points I think when we last checked in they were up at 11 maybe it was 10 to spend some victory points to continue to pull some cards with the hope of getting a hash mark on the middle oval here in this case to attempt to capture a hash mark as needed for that and they didn't get one and they, they kept trying a little bit but finally gave up so Hancock and Adams both remain uncaptured at this point, but we have a stack of British regulars there. So this is where it stands at the beginning of turn nine when the game changes a little bit with the entry of all these reinforcements.
here's an opportunity to take a look at some of how combat works. On the one hand, combat is really simple. There are no line of sight rules. There's no terrain modifiers. There are, there's no CRT even. You are simply rolling dice and getting a hit on a five or a six, depending on certain circumstances. But it's a little complicated because there are a number of different types of combat that can be initiated. And I'm going to go through them here and demonstrate at least what's going to happen. Now, in this situation, um, well, let me start by saying the first is an attack action. So an attack action is simply if there is a unit um, in the same region. We're not picturing that here because these are two different regions, as you can see, divided here. But um, if there were units of opposing sides in the same region, you could do an attack action uh, one against the other. And you don't have to select all your eligible units to attack. Um, they simply cannot have fired before. There is also an assault action, which means that you can take units from one region, move them into a different region, and then attack in that region with the same restriction, except those units cannot have moved. So for example, this is where we were. I couldn't do an assault action here because we've already moved these units. We can't re-move them. Um, and the these types of actions are available to both the British and the Patriots. The, um, the British player alone has another um, type of combat action, which is the charge action. And so what that means is they have to do this um, from a unit uh, that already has a leader, and they also have to have an unbroken British regular that has not moved or fired, and it can have any number of Patriot units in there. So we don't have that condition here, but um, that is another way that the British can charge at the enemy and it restricts the Patriot player from retreating before the combat. There is retreat uh, possibilities both before and after combat with various rules that come into play. I'm not really going to get into that here because it's um, easily understood from the rules, but the uh, charge action will deny the uh, opposition the possibility of retreating. So how do you determine uh, what happens in combat? Well, I mentioned that the game comes with eight dice, uh, and they're, they're not actually always enough, I must say, um, blue and red, and um, you're basically, essentially, the basic value is that the um, British are getting hits on a 4, 5, or a 6, and the Patriots are getting hits on a 5 or a 6. There is an optional rule where the to reflect the fact that the Minutemen themselves were better trained than the basic militia, you can institute um, a differentiation between the militia and the Minutemen. So you can say that your militia are going to score a hit only on a six and that the Minutemen are going to score on a five or a six. What happens if you're taking that rule is you need to really sort of separate out each um, each strength here is going to give you a dice. So um, you're going to need to sort of separate out and do different roles because you need to account for the dice that are hitting on a 5 or a 6 as opposed to a 6. Um, for this game right here, I'm not playing that way. Um, and you tally up all of your strength points. The leaders are not contributing. They contribute in many ways, but they don't contribute in terms of giving dice. So you're tallying up the strength points of the militia and the Minutemen that you have on the one side and um, versus on the other. Now, there's another type of factor that comes into combat, which is the difference between what they call simultaneous uh, fire or defensive fire. What this means is if you're doing simultaneous combat, I guess is what it's called, when combat is conducted simultaneously, everybody is totaling up their strength points and rolling that number of dice and then applying the hits. If it is defensive, it means that the combat's not simultaneous. So the defender is going to total up their strength points and roll that, um, and then the attacker is going to do the same. The difference is that when you choose simultaneous combat as the attacker, you need to take a hit initially. So you get a penalty for doing that, um, and you have to make that decision prior to combat. 
taking a look more closely here, we basically have 14 against 10 if we elect to go this route with simultaneous combat because the British is have stronger values than the uh, Patriots do. That's one possibility. Remembering, though, that the British are going to get hits on 4, 5, and 6. We're just going to be getting hits on either 5 and 6 or 6, depending on what rule you use. So you have to decide whether that is a benefit to you or not. I'm going to elect now to go with this simultaneous combat. I have to apply a hit um, to myself. Now, the I have a broken unit already. So if I apply a hit to this broken Minuteman, he's just gone from the game. Um, I could apply a hit to someone else and hope to rally at a later point in the game. Leaders can rally, for the most part, uh, leaders can rally one-on-one. -on -one. A leader can rally somebody at a later point in the game. So I'm going to apply my hit here to this unit one, and this brings me down to, I think, 13, one, two. After a lot, of, a lot of dice rolling, you'll just have to trust me on that. We scored, I basically playing the Patriots here, we scored five hits, but they scored eight hits. So that was a messy and probably not appropriate thing to try to do, but it was done. And then we have to account for all these hits. So we have to take the, um, we've got to take the eight hits, they've got to take the five hits. And you have options as to how to do that. I already have, I think, a wounded leader here. And... Some of these counters are going to have victory points at the end, so you want to think carefully about how you are uh, choosing to assign the wound. So that basically is what happened, and in this case, we were both kind of affected in combat. Now, there is a rule, I um, have to look up what it's called, where when both sides of a battle are affected in combat, you can retreat after the combat without penalty. So if both sides um, suffer losses, you can do a retreat without some of the penalties that you get um, when you are retreating before combat. And I haven't gone into that detail, but if retreating before combat, for example, sometimes you may have to take a hit or something of that nature. So in this scenario, we could opt to retreat, uh, both of us, because we were both, we both took some hits. To conclude the combat discussion, it's worth noting there are two actions, combat-related actions, that the Patriots alone can take, ambush and snipe. And we'll just look at the rules here because I don't have it set up on the map right now, but these basically allow, these are sort of modeling the activity that the Patriots actually had and their, their different way of conducting battles. So you were allowed to do this without actually having the presence of counters on the map. And it is essentially, um, in the ambush action, you are attacking some unbroken British regulars that have moved in the same region. And again, it says no units are needed to perform it. It's a die roll, um, and you can have the opportunity through an ambush to put some hits on the Patriots. And Snipe um, will let you t attack a large group of units that have moved at least two spaces along a road. And uh, again, it's a die roll. You don't actually have to have the units there on the map represented by counters. So this uh, gives a little historical flavor to it. And um, in my experiences of playing these games, it's very important to remember that you have these um, uh, in your pocket, as it were, as actions because um, you need them. I was originally interested in this game for my channel because I knew that it came with solitaire rules, and um, indeed it does. As I mentioned, there are it's really a solitaire scenario, and you can see here they call it a, they call it scenario. It is not the full game. In the solitaire version, you are coming in on turn eight, and uh, therefore the game itself is just turns eight to twelve. This is right when Percy's reinforcements have come into Boston, and you are. Are it directed to place them there prior to start of play and also to place in Concord some of the British regulars and leaders that have already 
gotten there and then uh, place your Patriot units around. What happens with this is that you are really playing a truncated version of the game because just looking here at the player aid, when I first set this up to play for the very first time, I went right to the solitaire scenario. I thought really actually that's just what I was going to focus on in the video as opposed to doing what I did do, which was show you the full-fledged game. But I realized uh, soon along that really uh, what you're getting in that because you are coming in sort of mid to end game, you're getting much more of just the sort of man to man uh, combat and everything that I talked about in terms of searching for hidden arms and raising the call to arms on the side of the Patriots, all of that has already occurred prior to your start of the solo experience. So when you're playing, say, using the British bot here on this player aid card, um, it's quite clear actually and very easily um, used that uh, what you are to do, but you can see that you're basically limited to certain various uh, moves, attacks, and charges. The uh, hinder action is in place so that as we talked about uh, I demonstrated what that what the hinder was. Um, rally, of course, is something you would prioritize. But I felt pretty quickly that I could feel there was something missing in the game. And because the game is of a relatively low complexity level, even for someone like me, who um, I've talked about, if you listen to other videos on my channel, having a great deal of difficulty in, you know, playing both sides of something and pretending I don't know what the other side is doing. Here, the goals are pretty clear. So when I was playing both sides, I was really the Patriots and I was using um, not exactly this AI uh, card as it was played out because from the beginning of the game, nothing is here concerning um, anything that happens in the beginning of the game. But the goals for the British are pretty clear, and it was relatively easy to figure out what they might do. But there is in existence in both games for Bunker Hill as well as Boston to Concord, the uh, solitaire bots, and you could make either side the solitaire bot. So that's a great offering from Compass to add that in, I think, and to spend the time to produce it, even if, in my opinion, it really is just, um, it is just to be considered a shortened scenario of the game. It might serve as a good way of learning the game if you are either playing against somebody or just for yourself to see how the basic um, actions play out, what the tactics of either side might be if you want to learn that way through the game designer seeing what uh, the tactics might be for either side. In terms of the game itself, overall, my thoughts on it, I found that um, it was, it really created an immersive experience and a narrative that had an arc and that changed over the course of the game. And to do that effectively using relatively simple rules, I think is quite difficult to do because it's very, it's a lot easier to create a game with a lot of variability from game to day, game and narrative tension developing and different mechanics at different parts of the game when you've got 60 or 70 pages of rules and exceptions and details and etc. Um, and tons of values on each counter and everything like that. And here we don't have any of that. Um, you know, the counters are pretty simple and indeed here's a leader counter with no value on it at all except the name. And yet because of the way the game is structured, because of the rules early game for doing searches and the Knight Riders moving and potentially being captured, and because all that ha is handled very simply, I mean, the whole idea of being captured is you just, you're just you rolling a six every time you move a Knight Rider, and on a six you're captured. Um, obviously, that's totally luck-based. There's no modifiers involved, but it becomes very quick, and it allows, I think, for a faster and faster playtime when you know the rules and it allows for you to really get the feel that at the beginning of the game um, on the side of the Patriots you are attempting to get as far as you can to muster as many of your militia as you can to alert as many people um, off the map to come in as possible. And then on the side of the British, what you're trying to do is to uncover as many of these hidden arms as you can. And the further west you go, the greater potential victory point of value there is immediately on the counter. Now, we, as we talked about, this can be modified. So it's not a guarantee of, say, three victory points here, but there are some counters further 
West that even have the potential for five if you make it. So the beginning of the game, the first few turns, this is what the focus is. And combat, to some extent, becomes ancillary. And as mentioned on the side of the Patriots, you want to try to avoid being the first to initiate that. Mid-game, you are positioning yourselves. There are victory conditions that uh, concern occupation in Lexington and Concord, and then coming back toward Boston. So there's a lot of positioning going on. If anything, I felt maybe there was one or two mid-game turns that felt a little bit flat. Um, possibly there could have been one or two fewer. I'm not really sure about that and probably haven't played enough to know. But Percy coming in on turn nine and having four turns to get to uh, Concord over here that you're not seeing here over on the west is um, once that happens, the tension kind of rises again because there is this sense um, that you're trying to, on the side of the British, to get somewhere, and then of course on the side of the Patriots to prevent that from happening. So uh, the game picks up a lot uh, toward the end and again, has a different type of flavor throughout. The other thing that happens if you do have your captured um, Knight Riders or Sons of Liberty, here's Hancock here, who I lost definitely in at least one game, and Adams as well, um, they are being moved back east. And in order to uh, assert or in order to free them, you really have to enlist the help of your own men because you definitely need that. You need to roll a six, basically, and in order to free them. And um, the presence of your own militia or Minutemen is going to add a value to your die roll. So to increase the chances of that happening, you've got to sort of commit some men, which makes sense to help in um, searching and, and finding them and releasing them so they can go free. So there is a tension on the side of the Patriots. You know, how many men do I commit back east when I also want to keep men on the West to protect. So all this to say in a different way that the, the game state does change throughout the game and that makes it interesting and it gives different tension throughout. And the goals are pretty clear in the game, but they do they are changing throughout. And for something, um, for a game where, for example, in this case, the militia, um, the excuse me, the British regulars here um, basically all have the same counter. These are Percy's men with the black dot here. There's, you know, again, there's not a lot of complexity built into the counters, but there is complexity that emerges out of the rules. There um, are options and choices and having the possibility of so many different types of actions and even within the combat, um, utilizing this concept of ambushing and sniping as well as attacking and assaulting and charging with relatively simple rules gives you a lot of choices as a player and it provides I think a maximum relationship between the number of choices you have and the rules that you need to sort of study and understand. So it uh, allows you to generate a story to generate uh, goals for yourself. It creates an experience and delivers a sense of narrative development. Um, and this experience, you know, it comes from within the game. It comes from the story that emerges from the gameplay and the mechanics and the rules, which is, I think, very effectively done within what is essentially a uh, you know, really on the borderline, I'd say, between a light and a medium game. If you call it a medium game, it's a, it's a lightweight on the medium side, as I said earlier. Um, I don't know that I would call it a light, light game because there are a number of exceptions to the rules and things do change, but it is really not too complex a game from the perspective of the war game genre or the war gaming uh, player. I guess some of the sacrifice there might be on the side of realism, and if you are uh, somebody, you know, there's no issues of leadership or, uh, well, I guess there are some leader, I'll take that back. There are, the leaders do have functionality, they can rally, etc. but they're really, uh, they're not issues of being in command or out of command. There's no line of sight, there's no terrain effects, there's no um, supply issues. Um, all of this is just absent in the game. You could say it's just abstracted, but it's not even really abstracted. I mean, strength values are abstracted. If you are somebody who is looking for something in more detail or a, more of a simulation, you 
will not be happy with this game. But if you are not looking for that, if you're looking for a uh, more of a gamey experience um, with this as a subject matter, I think you would be very satisfied with the game. And even if you were playing it, as I have demonstrated here, just effectively choosing a side and seeing that those are your goals and that you're enacting the goals of the other side as if you were uh, basically playing out the AI, it's very doable. At least it was doable for me, and I'm really not somebody who is the type who can play both sides of the game because I just get too caught up in, you know, if one side did one thing, well, how would I respond? But I'm actually the person doing both sides. Here, because the goals are clear and not overly complicated, it is possible to do that and still kind of remain an active focus on your own side. So those are my thoughts on Revolution Road, at least the Lexington from Boston to Concord uh, included game. Uh, Bunker Hill, I'm sorry I didn't talk about that, but I had a lot to say about this portion of the game set, and um, a lot of the rules are similar for Bunker Hill. It is a much uh, more focused game. It takes place all within Boston, and it's more of a combat, 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 combat type of situation that may appeal to that type of gamer. For me, uh, the variability offered here, the narrative arc and change over the game was had the appeal, and so that's where I focused my efforts here on this video. And overall, I had uh, a great deal of enjoyment from this game. And I, the mechanics are easy to understand. Yes, there is a high degree of randomness and luck in certain aspects of it, but that luck is thematic to some extent. It makes sense if you're attempting, for example, to escape capture. Uh, you know, you need some luck on your side for that. So that makes sense to do. With a lot of meaningful choices and clear goals and not an overly complex rule set, I can highly recommend. Revolution Road from Compass Games. Thanks for watching.